What I'm going to talk to about today is about my Black and White Arts Pro Expel, the, the latest version. What you've got from me uh, when you purchased the panel was the following. So let me look up my addendum. So this was part of a download uh, when you uh, purchase a panel, right? So basically this is just an addendum. Uh, so if you want to know everything about the Artisan Pro X panel with all the other features, then you have to uh, refer to the original quick reference guide. This is just the, the addendum. Okay, I'm only- Joel, we're not looking at your screen yet. We're still no? looking at your face, yeah. My Okay, that's not so good, my face. <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> I have to share my screen, I forget, forgot to share my screen. Anyway, so I think you should be able to see my screen right now, correct? Yes, and recording is on. Okay, then I'm going to stop my video. Okay, so you can still see my screen. So this is the addendum that you received upon purchase of the panel. So in this addendum, only the new features are being described. If you want to know everything about the panel, you have to refer to the original quick reference guide. It's also there, especially on the Dropbox showcase folder. So if you click on the cloud button that's here in the panel, this one, this the cloud button, you will uh, get access to the uh, showcase Dropbox uh, files and you can look everything up over there. Even better yet, instead of uh, going through the quick reference guide, it's better to just watch all the uh, previous webinars that I've recorded on Black and White Artists Pro X. Uh, they're all available on YouTube. So the only thing you have to do then is to just go to my panel and just click on this, uh, uh, well, YouTube button. It's not actually a YouTube button, but uh, you click on it and you get access to my playlist with all the Black and White Arts Pro X uh, videos. I think I can recommend those two for those who haven't watched the uh, webinars before. So part one and part two, they're two, two and a half or even three hour videos. So they're quite uh, extensive and quite detailed. So if you haven't uh, watched those videos before, I can highly recommend that. So if you have done that and you want to know even more, then you can always watch those smaller videos that you see here. So uh, tutorial one, two, three, and four. But I would recommend starting with this for everyone who haven't watched those videos yet. So I'm not going to explain the basic features in the panel that are already explained in the comprehensive tutorial series earlier this year. I'm just going to discuss the new features so that's going to be part of the, uh, the, the first hour. So until the break, so we're going to have a break at, uh, at the top of the hour. Uh, going to take a break then. And after that, uh, I'm going to do a few quick workflow demonstrations. And, I'll, and then I'm going to take all your questions, okay? So that's going to be approximately 30 to 45 minutes that I'm going to take uh, any question that you might have whether it's about the new features in the panel or about the older features, it doesn't matter. You can basically ask any sort of question you like, as long as it is about photography, okay? So <laughs> no other questions, please. Okay, I'm going to admit him as well. So let me have a look at the addendum then. So if you would go through the addendum, you would see the uh, an overview of all the uh, new features. Okay, I'm going to struggle again with my uh, scrolling. I have to Okay. So first of all, there are, are a few new features, the new styling section, I'm going to explain that in a, in a few minutes, the color grading section, local contrast adjustments, the luminosity mass, so more luminosity mass granularity. I think this is a very important new feature in my panel, together with this one, uh, this one too, of course. Uh, there's also a, a new global contrast high key feature. And this is a very important one. And uh, basically, uh, uh, because a lot of people have been asking me for the diagonal restore features, I've added this to the panel. I think this makes a lot of a difference for a lot of people. So I'm going to de demonstrate that as well. So now I'm going to go to my panel. I'm going to have to move you that way, that way. So first of all, if you look uh, at the uh, top rows, 
I've added uh, two, no, uh, two new presets as well, very uh, simple basic presets. One's called safe selection. I did it because some people, and especially Ben Harvey from the UK was asking for a safe selection just to make it even easier. And I've also added uh, an add noise feature. So I'm going to explain that too. This is a very basic adjustment and it's uh, predominantly uh, intended to get rid of some banding in the sky because that's something that you will always uh, encounter, especially if you're going to push the contrast in your black and white photo, it's easy to end up with banding. But the thing is, it's not real banding. Most of the times it's just fake banding as I call it, caused by the downscaling by Photoshop from a 16 bit image to an eight bit image when you zoom out. I'll get to that later on. <clears throat> uh, of course, what I've done here is also the, uh, the new quarter luminosity mask from even more granularity. This is great for uh, editing your photos with even more precision, but even better to create hard mass. Okay, so for all the people who don't know about my advanced masking method, they don't know what I'm talking about, but I think for those people who have seen my advanced masking classes or video, they know that if you uh, have this kind of granularity with your luminosity mass, you can create even better hard mass. So I'm going to do a short demonstration with that as well later on. Uh, so I'm not going to explain the advanced masking class in detail, of course, because there's no time for that. The advanced masking video takes up something around, what was it, five hours? So I'm just going to do a quick demonstration what you can do with the, with the quarter luminosity mask if you are creating hard mass. So this has been added, which is a great new feature, I think. Uh, if you go to global adjustments, you will also see that uh, here, there's also a new high key uh, contrast feature. So for those who've already seen my previous webinars know that what I would always do if I'm going to, let's say, darken a photo, for example, I would not just start with darkening a photo or a specific surface or area. I would always start with uh, removing the contrast. That is a very important aspect of my workflow to get rid of the contrast first and then darken it or lighten it. So basically what I would do then is start off with let's say black and white neutral conversion. Then on top of that, if I wanna darken something, I would uh, load a selection, a hard selection, and I would lo uh, load to, and I would uh, uh, hit the low key preset. I would remove the contrast at the same time it's getting darker. And then I would darken it with either creating depth or with the advanced adjustments. Basically, you can do the same now for high key photographs. So what you do then is if you wanna create a high key photograph and you already know about the principle of figure and ground, then you can do the following. You can isolate the figure from its ground and usually the ground should be more uh, uh, lower in contrast. So what you can do then is load the ground, remove the contrast by clicking on high key and then lighten it. So I've added that new feature as well. So more about that later. Uh, advanced adjustment. This is a very important new feature as well. So what you see here is that basically what you what you have here, and, and this requires either the entire canvas to be selected, or a hard mask to be loaded. Okay. But this the advanced adjustments. But this you can do basically the same but with, uh, with the free form selection. So let me give you a short demonstration of that with another photo. Let me take uh, the landscape. So I'm going to, let's say, convert it to black and white first. So suppose that, okay, I'm going to move this a little bit that way. So suppose that uh, I want to darken this foreground area over here. So usually in the old situation, if you have a mask, you can load your mask. So I've already created the mask for this photo. So let me use that mask first. So I'm going to load the sky mask, but then I'm going to invert it. Okay, so if I invert it, I will have the foreground selection. Makes sense, right? So in the old situation, I always had to do something like this, go to global adjustments, click on low key. Okay, then get, can set the intensity and do this. So you see that not only does it 
dark in the foreground, but it also uh, removes the contrast. See that? Which is different from doing something like this. Let me do that. Sky, invert, and then go to creating depth, for example, to darken it. Let's say I'm going to darken from bottom to top with a, let's say, D2. Okay, so you see that's darker now, this before and after. And this is with the low key. You see, it's different, right? It's a, uh, this looks, I think, more smoother, but less distraction. You darken it, but you also remove the contrast. But like I said, for this, in the, in the old situation, you always needed the, a hard mask to, well, to play with this. Or you can use a, a freeform rectangular mask and then uh, do the restore. Let me explain that. Okay, so hold on a minute. I'm going to get rid of. I'm going to get rid of this with the delete layer, and with this. So you can also do this. Hold on a minute. I'm going to move this zoom bar to the left up there. So what you could could also do is grab your rectangular marquee tool, do something like this, and I would always save it then like, uh, well, T1, for example. All right. And then you could do this low key, do this. But then you see obviously this hard edge, but that's easy to uh, mitigate. What you do then is basically load the selection that you just saved, temporary selection T1. Okay, and then you go to the creating depth and then you can restore with the extra small, for example, okay, like this. And then you see that it's completely gone, right? So it's a very natural selection then, very natural uh, removal of contrast, right? I mean, you can just look here and see that it goes very smoothly from here to there, all right? So those are the ways that you could do it in the past, removing contrast. So by going to global adjustments with a hard mask or with a, with a free, Oh my God, this is stupid. You can, you can all see this, right? <laughs> the Netflix uh, notification. Okay, so uh, you could either go in here with a pre-created hard mask, or you could create a, uh, with the rectangular marquee tool, a freeform selection and then restore it. But now you can also do it like this. Okay, I'm going to get rid of that. Now, instead of going here, you can go to advanced adjustments and now make a freeform selection. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit first. Let's say I'm going to do this. Let's say I want to remove the contrast in that part. Just a freeform selection. Now you click on, let's say I'm going to do this one. Low key, darken it and remove the contrast. All right. So you see now that there's no edge there, right? It's a very smooth transition from here to there. This before, this is after. So that's what you can do now with uh, with this. I think this is a very important uh, addition. It looks very similar to what's happening here, but this, for example, if you, if you look here, these are just darkening or lightening uh, presets, also with a smooth transition, but it doesn't remove the contrast. Okay, so th there's a big difference between darkening and removing contrast and then darken it or uh, lightening or, Remove contrast and then lighting it. It's 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 entirely different. I hope you all agree with that, okay? Because uh, the way that I work is always like this: first remove contrast, then darken or lighten it. It gives much better effects. And usually, I would always I would uh, apply those presets like uh, removal of contrast and then darkening or lightening it in an area that doesn't contain my figure, but just the ground. So are there any new people in here who have never heard about the figure ground principle, who've never seen any of my videos? If so, then you can let me know. Let me check my chat box now. So, so maybe it's good that I give you a short explanation. So if you would uh, watch the videos, the, the, the webinars, but also the other videos on my YouTube channel, you would know that uh, when I analyze the photo, 
there's always a figure and there's a ground. Figure is the most important object in your image that needs to have the highest contrast uh, and it, it should be uh, the brightest in light. Okay, because the thing is that the human eye will always go to parts of the image with the highest contrast and the brightest light. So if you have analyzed your photo and you have, let's say, uh, determined a specific object to be your figure, so that needs to have the brightest light and the highest contrast, all the rest is considered to be ground. Whether this is foreground or background, it's called ground. That needs to have lower contrast and less brighter light. So usually I would lower the contrast, I would use presets like this in the ground, not so much in the figure. Is that clear to everyone? I'm going to give you a minute so people can catch up with what I've been saying. Any questions for now about this specific new feature? And uh, about when to use it specifically? Because if you have a question, it, yeah. If you have a question, you can unmute yourself or type in the chat box. One of the two. Because the thing is, I see a lot of people. Uh, well, first of all, not knowing about the figure ground principle. I think it's a very important principle in in art, it, in the creation of, of images. But uh, if you have knowledge about that, you know what needs to have the highest contrast, the most detail, and the brightest light. It's always the figure. Okay. And the ground should always be lower in contrast. And I see a lot of people just, well, playing with contrast globally, which in my opinion, my humble opinion, isn't a very effective way of creating, especially fine art images, okay? So you always need to start with lowering the contrast before you uh, darken, lighten the ground. I'm not talking about the figure, but only talking about the ground. I hope that is clear for now. So in those cases, you apply either those for free with freeform selection. So I'm going to show you that again. So let's say I'm going to do this with the sky. I'm going, I wanna make the sky a little bit more high key. I can just do this, okay? And then just click on, let's say high key. I can make it lighter in a very natural way. Okay, I'm going to remove the selection. You see that this is what's happening, okay? And if I zoom in, you see that there's not going to be any visible edge in there. You see that? And it is different from lightning, but especially when you, <clears throat> sorry, especially when you light uh, darken uh, grounds, then this uh, will be even more visible if you don't do the removal of contrast. Okay, so let me do another thing. Let's say I'm, I wanna darken the sky, but not without but not before darkening, uh, sorry, removing the contrast first. I can do this again. I would click on this. Okay, you see that it's going to be, this is maybe a little bit too much. I should have used the other one. So let me use this one, the, the minus minus. Okay, it, it means you're going to remove the contrast for, well, but to a specific medium kind of uh, extent. So here you see that it's darkened. Okay, and the difference with uh, this, okay, if I dark it like this, D2, so the normal darkening features, I will show you that in a second, it's, it's a little bit different. So this is normal darkening without removing contrast, and this is darkening by removing the contrast. You see that the highlights are going to be suppressed over here. It looks a little, little bit smoother, right? Am I making sense still? So, Joel, there's a couple of questions that we may want to answer right now. Yeah, sure, go ahead. One of them is, uh, can you describe, Nina says, can you describe what the individual boxes in the new section under advanced, advanced adjustments represent? Why 12 choices? Uh, those ones, right? Yeah. So, so, so basically, you know, what I could have done is to go work with, uh, with a slider. I didn't go with that because I wanted to make it uh, very simple, you know? And I think that by doing it like this with presets, soft, medium, or strong, okay, whatever you want to call it, okay? I think it's better because then you don't have to play with slides. And it, it's, it's, it's very subtle, by the way. So for example, here, if I do this here, 
Okay, I'm going to save this selection. I can reuse the same selection again. I'm going to call it uh, T2. Okay, so suppose that if I click on this, it just is a, a soft removal of contrast and, and slight darkening, right? Okay, I'm going to do the same now. I'm going to load the same selection. Okay, I can do it with this. This is the medium and this is strong. I think that uh, speaks for itself, right? So this is stronger. Well, this is less strong difference before and after. See that? So Dana it, says it, she's got it. Yeah. So uh, the same for mid key. So if you if you don't want to have a, uh, let's say a dark uh, image, you can use the mid key and for high key images, you can use this. And this, this new thing of there, the S curve, that's a basic S curve. So if you wanna, let's say, increase the contrast over here, you can just make a freeform selection. You can click on that and it will increase the contrast there. Okay, you see it here and without any uh, transitions, visible transitions, see that? So this is something that I would, uh, wouldn't would use that much, okay? Just for specific uh, small areas because you're just increasing the contrast. Well, I think the, the bigger trick is to lower the contrast and then darkening or lightening it with those presets or with the creating depth presets. That's an entirely different kind of thing with an entirely different kind of effect, okay? This is what I, what I would always recommend, lowering contrast for the ground, adding dark, or lighter tones, but either advanced adjustments or with the creative depth adjustments. Okay. Is this clear up to now, this specific section about the uh, uh, advanced adjustments? So that the normal darkening and lightening presets, and now also the, the contrast preset that play a very, very important role in my workflow. Is this clear? David asks, since this feature decontrasts, is this something to use at the in the start of the editing process? Absolutely, yeah. So the thing is, okay, I'm going to show you right now. Okay, I'm just going to do a very quick uh, uh, edit of this photo, not too fancy, but just a very quick one. I'm going to, let's say, what I want is to is the sky to be a little bit darker, not so much high in contrast, but I want the light to be here because I want the eyes of the viewer go here, okay? So following this, those lakes that you see here, by the way, this is landscape in, in Ireland, in Killarney. Okay, so I want the viewer to follow this, let's say this kind of uh, tra trajectory towards that specific part, okay? so. I want to darken the sky. I want to make this part in the sky a little bit lighter so the eyes go there. I want to remove the contrast over here, okay, because I don't want to see the details. And at the same time, I want to darken it. And then this should be somewhere in the mid gray section. So I've already done the black and white neutral conversion here. So now I'm going to start with the uh, uh, darkening and the removal of contrast in the foreground. So this is indeed one of the first things that I would do. So this is called uh, removal of contrast and at the same time darkening. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to start, I'm going to do it a little bit more moderately now. All right. So that's the first part this is before, after. I can also say I wanna make this lighter. Okay, so I'm going to roughly select that part. Okay, now I'm going to go with this because I don't want to remove the contrast there. I just want to lighten it a little bit. I can use, let's say this. Okay, I'm going to show you. So before, after, okay. Now I want to darken the sky. So in this case, I'm not going to do the freeform selection because I already created a hard mask over here. I'm going to get rid of those two channels now. And by the way, for those who didn't know yet, all your masks are always stored in your channels panel or channels tab, okay? 
So I'm not going to go into detail in, uh, on this part because that's something that I've explained extensively in my previous webinars. This is the, the hard mass that is stored in your channel step. So going back here, I'm going to load the sky selection there. And now I can say, okay, I'm going to make use of the traditional global adjustment features. So I'm going to go with low key here. Okay, and I'm going to do it like that a little bit. Well, maybe a little bit more like that. Something like this. So I, I went from, sorry. I went from here, neutral to this in a few basic steps, right? It's not too fancy, but the thing is uh, just to give you an, an idea of the workflow that I would use. And now I can darken this by going here, advanced adjustments and say, for example, D1. All right, you see that? So again, very natural transitions here. You don't need to worry about uh, uh, edges or whatever. It's just very smooth. And on top of that, I can now load my sky selection like this. And now I'm going to make use of the creating depth. So I re remember that I think it was David also who asked about uh, when to use the creating depth feature, feature or the other features. Mike, do you have the, uh, the, the, the spreadsheet with the question from David over there? Yeah, so maybe sure. Maybe I can answer second. it at the same time. Yep, hang on. Okay, all right. David. So we're waiting for Mike to come up with the question that David was right, asking. It's kind of long. I'm going to read the whole thing. As we begin the editing process in a given image, would you suggest beginning our adjustment of the light with the creating depth feature of the panel or the luminosity masks in the Pro Tools action? Are there any advantages or disadvantages of doing one first as opposed to the other first? Okay, that's actually a different question, right? It's, uh, okay, so the, but basically, I would always say that the uh, the use of luminosity masks, I would always uh, keep to the end. So usually I would go with basic darkening. So but what I mean with basic darkening is, first of all, removal of contrast, then darken it with the basic tools like advanced adjustments or the creating depth adjustments. And then in a later stage, I would uh, go with the luminosity mask and would add some highlights or even some darker details. That's always the, the workflow that I would use. I mean, it, 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 is, it isn't set in stone, of course. You know, sometimes it's, it's better to start with luminosity mass and then go with the basic darkening and lightning. But roughly speaking, as a rule of thumb, you could say, I would always start with the normal darkening and lightning features with the advanced over the creating depth. And then I go into the detail. So basically I go from global to more detail. So, and, and, and more detailed is when you work with luminosity mass. Correct. I mean, if you if you load luminosity mass in the in the right way, you're basically targeting specific kind of detail in your photo. Makes sense, hopefully. Is, does that answer your question, David? You have to unmute unmute yourself before answering. Yes, Joel. Thank you so much. It makes sense. I appreciate that. Okay. All right. So. Going back to this photo, so uh, I've darkened it with the advanced adjustments. So now what I can also do is to uh, darken it with the creating depth feature. But this is uh, basically meant to really create depth. Okay, so the thing is with creating depth, if you don't know yet, and if you haven't seen my webinars before, uh, depth is always created not only by, by, by use of perspective lines, but most importantly, by the use of differences in luminance values. So usually something is perceived as having depth if it goes from dark to light or light to dark. Okay, you see that very specifically in my architecture photographs, but it applies to anything. It applies to landscapes as well. So the objects closest to you should always be darker like this, and the objects farthest away from you should be lighter. So that's a, that's a transition from dark to light. So it creates depth. Okay, so this kind of darkening is different from the advanced adjustment darkening. It's just local darkening without the intention of creating depth. Well, creating depth is basically there to really create depth, if that makes sense. So I can now go from dark to light here with the, let's say a large D2. 
sorry, that's uh, the wrong one. Okay, I'm now going from bottom to top. I should be going from top to bottom. All right, I'm going to get rid of this layer. Okay, I'm going to go from top to bottom with large D2. Okay, you see that? This before, this after, uh, after, and I go from light to dark to the top. So from bottom to top with a light, let's go with, uh, so here are the lights, here are the darks. So a small, medium, large SML represent the coverage. So small is roughly 20%, medium roughly 50% coverage, and large roughly 75% coverage. Okay, so meaning from uh, one direction to the other. So if you go from bottom to top, it means it has a coverage from bottom to top for 75% if you would click on the large. Okay, if you wanna know more, if you wanna know more about that, please refer to my previous video tutorials on YouTube. But now I'm going to go with light here from bottom to top, small, roughly 25% because I want to lighten this part up. You see that? So that would basically be my, my workflow, roughly speaking. Is this, is this also clear, David? Because you were the one asking, right, uh, David? I think so. Okay. Yes, Joel, thank you. I appreciate that. It's just always a little confusing about like what order to do things in, but you really cleared it up. Thank you, Joel. Okay, I'm, I'm going to repeat this, by the way, many times in this uh, session. Okay, so it's always uh, removal of contrast for your ground. So you can increase the contrast and the brightness in your figure. Okay, so you start with removing the contrast, whether you go dark or light doesn't matter. And then you add the light or the darks. That's usually my workflow. And on top of that, you can create the darks or the lights, adding the darks and lights with the, with the creating depth future. Because at this, if you do that, you will at the same time increase the depth perception if you do it the right way, of course. I mean, if I go from, from dark to light there, it doesn't make that much sense, okay? So uh, that's this. That's a very important new feature together with uh, this one. Um, this hasn't changed. Creating depth, okay? So that's all about the addition of the restore diagonally. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate that later on in more detail, I think. Okay, but let me show you what that thing does. And people who are familiar with the, with my creating depth feature and with the restore feature, they know how important restore is, right? I mean, restore is uh, such an essential critical step in my workflow that without it, I cannot even create my own images, all right? So it's a, uh, a very important step in everything I do in black and white photography. And uh, some people do it without, without the presets. You can also do that, uh, by the way. But, you know, it's uh, uh, no matter how you do it, uh, this cannot be, you know, cannot be missed in any kind of black and white workflow because it makes life so much easier. I'm going to show you that later on, but let me give you a short demonstration of how, what you can do with uh, the diagonals. Okay, I have to look up my stuff here. Uh -huh. My test photos. Where are my test photos? There it is. And the grace gradient sample. Okay, I'm going to load that. One minute, please. I'm going to grab my drink for quickly. Okay. Everyone, anybody that's confused, uh, just remember that we have a question and answer session at the end. And uh, hopefully by then you'll have everything cleared up. But if not, you'll be able to ask questions later. Thank you for that, Mike. Okay, so I'm back again. So let me show you the following. This is my basic uh, demonstration grayscale kind of uh, grid to play with the gradients. So let's say that uh, 
I'm going to have this. I'm going to make a selection here. I'm going to do some darkening, some random darkenings. Okay. Uh, top to bottom. I have a different mouse, by the way. It's very sensitive. So you see me sometimes missing the presets, but it's... Uh, I don't know why I'm using a very sensitive mouse right now. I am going to change it to during the break, I guess. But let me darken those things first. So you get a better idea. Okay. So now I'm going. So if you, as you may know, uh, if you're going to use a restore feature, you always have to merge down your uh, top layer, your, your latest result. Uh, as you have to merge it down to the last layer without the adjustment. But this is just a rule of thumb, by the way, okay? Because there's also, there are also situations where you shouldn't be merging down to the last layer with, without the adjustments. But people who've seen my webinars before know exactly what I mean with the example of the tree, right? But the, the tree example. But in this case, I'm just going to merge it down to the last layer without the adjustment. That is here. So this is the last layer without the adjustment, right? So now I, I can restore diagonally, diagonally, okay? So I'm going to go from bottom left to top, sorry, to, to top right corner. Yes, I'm saying it correctly with extra small. You see that? That's the, the first one. I can also go the other way from top to bottom that way. So now you can do all those kind of uh, things. I can also go with the with the small from bottom right to top left. Yes, like this. You see that? And also with, with the medium like this. So I think this is a very valuable new feature that will make life even easier. And especially for architecture, I think that uh, the diagonal restore is going to make it even better. Uh, it's only a 45 degree angle. Uh, I haven't, uh, just uh, you know, I didn't consider any other angle because I, I believe, I truly believe that this is more than enough. Especially if you combine that with the, with the normal uh, vertical and horizontal restores, I think you can basically get any kind of effect that you want. Because uh, in my own experience, I have never used anything else than, than let's say around 45 degree kind of restore, all right? So this is going to be uh, hopefully for a lot of people something that they're going to make use of quite a lot. Any questions about the restore feature that even though it's just a very small, simple thing, it is a very important feature. And, and again, I cannot emphasize enough that if you don't use this, whether with the pedal or just manually, then you're missing out on a lot of uh, artistic opportunities in Photoshop. Okay, this perhaps, uh, I think I would say, this is the, the single most important step in my workflow. The single most important step in my workflow. I cannot emphasize that enough. A lot of people think, okay, it's about the black and white conversion, the global adjustment, or advanced adjustment, or even creating depth, or even microzone. Now I'm saying this, if you don't know what to do with that, if you forget that step, you're missing out on a lot of creative options. So pay a lot of attention to this. And basically you can use this anywhere. It's not only with creating depth, you can also use with advanced adjustment, global adjustment, anything. This, I say it again, very, very critical. If you do use this in the right kind of way, again, whether you do, do uh, use it with the panel or manually, doesn't matter. You're going to enjoy it so much. You're going to be, you're going to be increasing your artistic uh, opportunities and options so much more with uh, the creating depth. It is the single most important step in my workflow. Okay, any questions about this? By the way, if you have a question, you have to unmute yourself, by the way. Okay, I, I take it that there's no one asking questions for now. So restore, uh, let me go. Okay, I'm going to close this down. I'm going to leave this here. I'm going to go with, uh, okay. I, I wanna show you the uh, the color grading right now, okay? Because that is also very uh, interesting, I think, okay? So uh, 
this is not just some made up color palettes that, I, that I've been using here. What I've done is to watch a high definition video. I took a few sample screenshots from that specific video, high resolution. I extracted the five most important colors from that movie for a specific representative scene or sequence. And then I built it into this preset. So what you see here, I didn't make that up, okay? It's, these are the exact color palettes from those movies. So, okay, before I go into detail there, I think, uh, you know, color grading or better yet, let's say, fine art photography is not only about color grading, about uh, black and white. It's also about color photograph, uh, photographs, okay? I mean, you can easily create, and no one would argue with that, I think, you can easily create fine art photographs in, in color. And I wanted to give people an opportunity to make uh, more subtle uh, color photographs by using the color grading presets that are based on some iconic, well-known, famous movies, okay? So, and the difference between toning and color grading, okay, because they look a lot the same, you know? The, the thing is, toning, is meant for black and white photographs initially, but it can also be used on color photographs with very subtle results, by the way. So this toning is for both black and white and for color uh, photographs. Color grading is actually only meant for color photographs. If you try to use it on black and white photographs, it will work as well, but it isn't that subtle because it has uh, five different colors that are going to be applied to the photo and it just works better with, uh, uh, with color photographs. So this uh, color only, you can also use for black and white at your own risk, but toning, you can use it for black and white and color photographs. Another big difference between toning and color grading is that in toning, especially if you look here at split toning, I'm always using three different colors, three different hues. The traditional split tone is always with two different hues, right? So what they do is to, uh, uh, let's say, assign a specific hue to uh, either the shadows or the highlights, and and the same for the uh, for the, for not with another color to either the shadows or highlights, and you do it in such a way. Uh, according to the color wheel in a harmonious kind of way. So if you know about the color wheel, then you know that there are complementary colors or analogous colors. So you would always go with an analogous or uh, complementary color scheme. What I've done here is to create three hues, okay? And I would assign it to uh, specific uh, uh, tonal sounds in a split complementary way. What I mean with that is the following. I hope I have it right here. Let me look that up. Uh, let me see, there's the demo files, I think, this. So here, I think most people know about the color theory, right? So if you have the exact opposite color like here, that's called a complementary color, okay? So if you look here, uh, you see this, if you choose blue, for example, and you wanna have a, the exact complementary color, you, you have to go with this specific hue there, the orange yellow kind of color there. Split complementary is like this. So basically you say, okay, this is the exact opposite color, uh, contrasting color. So this would be the, the complementary color. But if you pick out the, uh, the adjacent uh, hues, you would have a split complementary color scheme. So this is what, is what I've been using in my split complementary split toning over here. So they're quite advanced. Usually you only use two channels. I use three color channels for split toning. And usually in, if you look at uh, other YouTube tutorials in Photoshop, for color grading, they would use three color channels. I'm using five. So that's much more to make it even more subtle. So that's a big difference with between this and that. And also the big difference with traditional split toning or uh, color grading techniques. 
So how did I do this? I'm going to show you. I just a quick look behind the scenes, okay? Suppose that, okay, I'm going to open this one. So this is from the movie Togo. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's a nice movie, but the nice color effects, by the way. So I'm going to open it in Photoshop. So this is a, a screenshot from that uh, video from the movie Togo. Very, very nice uh, video, by the way. So how can you uh, extract the five dominant colors from this screenshot? What you do then is go to file. And by the way, this is also explained on the internet. So this, this is nothing special, okay? Save for web. What you see here is set to GIF. In this case, you can set it to selective or perceptual. Doesn't really matter. I always go with uh, either one of those two. But in this case, I'm going to go with selective. Set it to GIF. And the colors here are set to 256 colors. I only need five. So you fill out five. So what you get there in this in the swatch in the color table are five different colors. So that's the five dominant colors in this specific scene. You have to make sure to set it from to sort it by luminance. Okay, if you don't do that, then you don't know what kind of you to, to assign to a specific tonal zone. Sort it by luminance. So it goes from dark to light that way. Okay. Now you have to save it, save color table. <clears throat> and then you can name it, uh, in this case, uh, I've named it over here. You see that that's the color table that I saved. I'm not going to save it again, all right? So I'm now going to click cancel. So, what you, so you have saved that color table with five dominant colors of this specific photograph. So I'm going to close this down now. And now you can go to your color swatches, all right. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Oh, oh, what, what am I doing now? Okay, I'm going to, where's the load? I'm not having the right, hold on a second. I have to go with, find the swatches. The swatches there, all right, so here, if you have that, you can load that color table that you've just uh, saved, okay? And then, where's that load thing now? And now you can load one of those color tables, right? So I've already done that. So let's go here, for example. Okay, I'm going to load. The, I'm going to do another uh, example. So, but it's basically the same as the, as the the Togo color table. What you can do now is just click on that. Okay, and now you can. Uh, I just want to have this. So here you see that there's specific hexadecimal value over there that you can use. But I always look at this. So that's the U. That's the saturation. And there's the lightness there, okay? So you can go through all of that like this. So you can click on that, you see the different kind of values. So that's how I created the, the five color channels for my color grading, okay? Joel. So, uh, yeah? Uh, two things. One, is this the same thing as an LUT? So, well, it looks a little bit like that, but it's a little bit different because I'm using luminosity mass to assign it to specific uh, uh, well, tonal so. Okay, but I, I'm going to show you that. So, but basically, this is how we know what kind of use and saturations I need and lightness I need. Just click on those uh, colors, okay, the, the swatches that you have there. And then you know exactly what you what you need to have, use, saturation, and lightness, or brightness, okay? So you, you write it down, for example, and now you can assign it to your photo. So let me do it for this photo. I'm going to close this down. So I'm explaining this so you get a better idea of what this actually is, okay? So it's not just made up. So I'm, I'm going to show you, but before I do that, I need to have a color photograph. So I'm going to show you something uh, that you might not have seen yet before. So usually when I work on color photographs, but well, not usually, but let's say uh, 
quite a few times. When I work on a color photo, I would start in black and white first. Because the thing is, if I work in black and white, I can see the, the difference in luminance values much better. I can see the contrast so much better. I can see the depth perception so much better. So I work in black and white first. So this is the Flatiron building in New York. So I've worked in it, on it in black and white. And you see, if you compare this to, to my other architectural photographs, it's not as high contrast and not as dark as my normal black and white photos. I've done it deliberately because I want to, I want to make this a color photograph. So I've done this in black and white. So what I do now is open up my uh, original color photograph with the same uh, dimensions, okay? So now I'm going to copy this duplicate layer, go to my original color photograph there, duplicate it there. So what you have then is this, this is the, the added to black and white version of this original color photo. So this came straight out of the camera. Okay, no additions, no, no edits, nothing. So what you can do to get your color photograph then is go stand on your black and white layer, set it to luminosity. And what it does then is to, is to keep the luminance values of your black and white layer. So everything that you've done on black and white is still there because you're, it's still in this layer, but you're uh, getting the color uh, information from your layer down below. So you see that now you have this, color photo that has been processed in black and white style. You see this, the original color, this is, uh, this is the, the edited color in black and white. I hope that makes sense. So this is usually the way that I work. Okay, so suppose that I now want to make it even better by adding specific kind of color grading that would make it look more harmonious, more in line with specific color theories. Now I can go with any of those presets and you see that it shows the, the palette. Let me go with, uh, let me see, I'm going to go with the, with the Revenant. Famous movie, I think you've, uh, you must have seen that. If not, go watch it. It's a very <laughs> nice movie. You see that it might be a little bit uh, too bluish, right? But you can go in here now. And what I've done here, is to create luminosity mass per channel. So darks, mid darks, mid tones, mid lights and highlights. Usually with color grading, you would only have the darks, the mid tones and the highlights, but I've added the mid lights and the mid darks to make it even more subtle. And you can change that. So just by clicking on that, you, uh, you can let's say decrease saturation. I wouldn't touch this, you, okay, don't touch that because that's already, if you, if you change that, you're going to change the entire color scheme, then this doesn't make any sense anymore, okay? So I, I would only touch the saturation or the light because that depends heavily on the type of photo that you would have. So, but usually what I would do is to do the following. If you wanna decrease saturation, then always start with the mid-tones because the mid-tones has the largest coverage, has the largest range. So if you start here, then it will affect already quite a bit. I would, let's say, go a little bit down like that. You can also play with the lightness. Okay, I'm not going to do that. And then go with your darks, okay? And then go with your lights, etc. As long as you start with the mid-tones, okay? But I'm just going to change it a little bit. I'm going to also do this. And you see that you can make it already much more subtle, okay? But uh, this is the way to do it, okay? So uh, you can always also play with the U, but I would recommend doing that because again, you're going to lose the entire color scheme, the color palette from that specific movie. But here's what you see then, this before and after. It's a very subtle change, right? But it's ex exactly in line with the color palette from that specific movie. And those guys have already thought a lot about it, those guys in Hollywood, so they know what they're doing, okay? And uh, I applied, applied that to the photograph over here in a very subtle way. And in, at the same time, I'm giving you the opportunity to change the saturation by moving the saturation slider. So what's more important about this, you can also go in here to let you just decrease saturation uh, globally, but, uh, this is, but if you do that, you go to black and white again. Okay, you can also do that if you want to, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. 
you have to go in here and then change saturation. What's also important is the following. So how did I do this with the highlights and the darks, mid darks, etc.? So I'm not going to go in technical detail in, uh, on this, you know, because that's uh, way too much. But the thing is the following. If I click here, I can see them, sorry. I can see the, the mass. So this is a normal linear luminosity mass, a normal luminosity mass that everyone can create with the panel, with any other panel. The same for the darks. It's a normal linear, sorry, hold on a minute, luminosity mass, okay? This is, uh, this is a zone mask. It's also luminosity mass, but it's a symmetrical luminosity mass, okay? And these are asymmetrical luminosity mass. So linear luminosity mass, linear luminosity mass, symmetrical luminosity mass. And these are asymmetrical luminosity mass. So what's that? Okay, I would refer to my website then because things, I'm not going to explain this here, but if you go to my website, there's an article on my website that goes into this. So let me go here. By the way, it's, it's still Black Friday. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go in here. Let me show you. There's this article that I created, Asymmetrical Luminosity Mass and More Accurate Editing Photoshop. So if you want to know more about uh, the difference between linear luminosity mass, symmetrical and asymmetrical luminosity mass, just go read this uh, article, okay? And you can also see how I create those luminosity mass. So basically uh, what I've done is to use customized asymmetrical luminosity mass for all those uh, tonal areas. So it's quite sophisticated. It's not just some, oh, okay, I'm going to apply some colors, some random colors, no, not at all. Okay, just to let you know how advanced this color grading section is. Um, but basically this is all you need to know, okay? So just forget about what I showed you, but that was just meant to show you how uh, how I approach this and that I didn't make up any of those colors, but they're the exact specific color schemes from those movies that are representative, sorry, from scenes that are representative for those movies. Joel? Any questions about this? I don't know if you want to take questions, but there's people that are begging for a fluids adjustment break. Say that again, a fluid adjustment break. <laughs> Yes, fluid adjustment is a. Oh, is sorry. A term. <laughs> sorry. Now I get it. I thought you were referring to a photograph. Okay. I thought, what do you mean with a fluid adjustment break in my photo? <laughs> okay, I, I I completely get it. Yes. Okay. Let's get a let's get a break. A ten minute break. Okay. Sorry. I mean, I didn't know I was running out of time already. Oh my God. Sorry about that, people. But uh, I'm just very passionate and enthusiastic and. I just completely lose track of time. So you want to, we, 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 are we going to do a break now, Mike? Yes, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. I'll see you back in 10 minutes. Okay, so- There's a number of questions. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, we still have five minutes left, right? But I, I can take some questions already for people who are already back uh, in the session. So what are those questions, Mike? Okay, so Leonard says the black and white version is an edited version of the original photo will be edited before it is duplicated to the color layer. Say that again, but where's, where's the chat box? Uh, okay, let me see. I'm not quite sure what he means. Leonard, do you wanna unmute yourself? The black and white version is an edited version of the original photo will be edited before it's, yes, correct, yeah. So what I do is just uh, uh, convert the original color photo to black and white, okay? And then do some editing in black and white, but very modest kind of editing, okay? Because the thing is, if you wanna end up with a, a color photo in the end, you cannot go with too a harsh contrast uh, for that color photo, because then it will translate to something that's too saturated. Okay, so you cannot go with a, with a black sky, for example. You cannot do that. So you have to be very modest in your editing. I hope that Leonard can hear thank me. You. Yes, yes, Joe, thank you very much. Yeah, 
Yes. Does exactly. it does it make sense what I'm saying over here? Yes. Yes. I. I uh, this is the first time that that, that I've seen something <laughs> like 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 this when you copy you copy your black and white photograph and then you put paste it onto the color photograph and then you can work on it from there. Exactly. Because if you do it like that, it's I mean. Uh, if you you can also work straight in color if you want to, but you know it's easy to be distracted by the color, so you do do not see the depth perception accurately, and that is something that I always want to do to see the contrast more accurately. So that's why I work in black and white first, and then go back to color, but I do it in this natural way, and I hope that you see it's natural because I'm still using yes, yes, the original you. color photo with the original color values, but. I'm only changing the lumino uh, luminosity values or the luminance values in, in there. I hope that Thank makes you. sense. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, oh, well. and then uh, <clears throat> David had an interesting question. Uh, he wonders if you would consider doing an in-depth webinar on the panel editing process with only color photos. I could do that, but not this year anymore. <laughs> I, I can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe that's something for, for next year to do a free webinar on editing color photos like this. Yeah, why not? And then uh, Lynn asks how to create and load our own color palettes. Is that something? No. You, can, you can do that, but then you have to create your own luminosity. Because the thing is, it uh, well, basically, you can create your own color palettes. And then you can, let's say, you can create a swatch, right? With the five colors that you have there. And then if you have something like this, you can basically create any kind of, uh, hold on a minute, I'm going to get rid of this. So suppose that you would have clicked on this, on the, uh, uh, the Revenant, okay? Then you can go in here and then replace all those colors that you see here with the colors that you've created yourself. Hopefully that makes sense. So you only have to create, uh, change the hue, the saturation and the lightness. D does that make sense? I don't know who asked that question, but let me see. Okay, I understand, all right. Any more questions that I can already take now? Mike, do you have a suggestion? Because I haven't followed this chat while yep. I was- uh, Let's see, Pablo says, question about loading selection from one file into another. Since the lat update Oh, no, latest update of Photoshop. I can only load selections that are on that file, not from others. Pablo, do you want to unmute yourself? That 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 is not correct. I think you can still uh, load uh, uh, a selection from another file into the current file. I mean, this is also the latest Photoshop version. I can show you that. I mean, else this uh, styling section wouldn't even work. But uh, what's where's the? This is Windows. Okay, where's the? Windows, uh, where's the about help uh, there, about Photoshop. So this is the, the latest version, you see that 2201. So this is the latest version. So I can still load, okay, hold on a minute. If I'm, okay, do I have a selection in here? Let me see, do I have selection there? No, I don't have selection there. Flat iron building, okay, let me find a, a photo where I have the selection separately. Let, let me check one, okay? Um, let me see. Okay, so... Sorry, just for some reason, uh, yeah. on the source document, I can only select the one I have. I cannot choose okay. a different source document. Okay, I think I know what it is. But the thing is, here, you see, I don't have any selections, right? In this one. But in this one, uh, the same photo, where is it? There it is. I have a, a mask. So I can show you here, if I go in here, I go to load selection, select load selection. Okay, hold on a minute. Load selection. 
Well, you're that is strange. I think you're right. Yes, it's been happening since the last update. Oh my God, this is terrible. I know. This was never, the, I didn't even notice that. That that shouldn't be, okay, you, I think you're right. Does anyone else has, have that problem with, uh, because this is not normal. Yeah, I always, I always kind of use your method. So I keep one file with all the selections. Yeah. And then work on a different version of that file. And yeah, I cannot load selections from the original file anymore. Oh, so Photoshop introduced yet another bug. Yes. That is because the, they are the exact same dimensions, 14, 3, 4, 1. Okay, let me check that with the other one because that can also be the case. Let me see image size. Oh, this is not the same. Okay, hold on a minute. I didn't use the same. So that might be the, the case. Okay, let me find another photo where I have the exact same dimensions. Okay. Uh, let me see. The, maybe I can change dimensions into the same. So this is, uh, again, image size. I'm going to copy this. Okay, see if it's, uh, it's not the same as this, but I can do this. Should be the same now. Uh, let me try it now. Is it the same exact same dimension? I'm not sure. Let me check image size. So this this is the same with five five nine two. Let me check that. Nine three. Okay. That okay. Let me find another photo because that makes a difference. Okay. If you have something like that, what I'm going to do now is to just do this. Hold on a minute. I'm just going to get rid of this. So I'm sure that I using the same photo with the same dimensions. Okay, just move it that way. Because I cannot imagine that they suddenly introduced that bug. Okay, I cannot imagine that. So I'm not going to use this. I'm going to use this. Okay, select, deselect. And I'm going to remove this. And I'm going to save this as a another photo and then we'll see if you're right about that uh, who was a pablo right uh yes pablo okay joel Outland. lynn says joel lynn says she had the same problem and she spent three hours with adobe lynn do you want to unmute and discuss yeah. that yeah i was having the same sort of issue and eventually adobe took control of the computer and couldn't make it work and told me yeah. to roll back to Empty. Okay, let, let me let me try to confirm or if that's indeed the case. So I'm going to load that with mask and without mask. Okay, let me try doing that. So we see if Adobe is right or not right, or if they introduce a bug or bug or not. Let me check. So this is the one without the mask, right? And this is the one with the mask. So I'm going to try to load it now. And now you can load it. So what Adobe doesn't know is that it needs to have the same dimensions. <laughs> so just tell them that, uh, Lynn. Yeah, they didn't check dimensions, Joel. You should do, always do that. That's the first thing you need to check. Thank you. So they, so they need to train their, their, their employees a little bit better there, I think. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I couldn't resist saying it. But you see, <laughs> Pablo, uh, yes. it, it still it still works. You have to have the same exact same dimensions, okay? Okay, yeah, something might might be different than when I did it. Yeah? Sorry. Okay, so I, I I thought I had the same dimensions in, with, the, in the, uh, with those two photographs, but it wasn't the case. So, but as long as you have the same dimension, you can still load it from another file. Okay, right? that, that's great. Thank you, Jordan. All right. So okay, so I'm digressing now. Uh, everyone's back again. Mike? Yeah, we're ready to go. Yeah. So uh, I've, the last thing I explained was about the uh, uh, the color gray. Were there any questions about that? Because I'm not going to go into this anymore. I'm just going to go to the styles and then I want to take all the questions. All right. Anyone questions about color grading for now? Let me see. How would you pump up the colors? 
how do I pump up the colors? Yes. Uh, you, you mean in here, in this yeah. photo? After you've done everything. Okay, so for example, if you, uh, okay, I'm going to do another one. So I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to apply a new uh, color scheme. Let's say I'm going to go with uh, Blade Runner, okay? I don't think you want to pump up the colors. Actually, you want to decrease the colors <laughs> in most cases. But let, let me see. So this is uh, the, the Blade Runner 2049 uh, palette, okay? So if you want to pop up the colors, you just click on, let's say this, for example, the on this icon that you see there, the, the color thing. And then you can, if you want to, saturate it even more. But especially if you go here with the, with the mid tone. So if you want to decrease or increase, pop up the colors, then go especially to the mid tones because that has the largest range because it's a symmetrical luminosity mass that has a wide range. Then you go do this, but I don't think you want to pump up the colors too much with the with this. I would recommend actually decreasing colors a little bit more. Yeah, maybe it's the contrast I was thinking of. Okay, but does this okay, answer? I got it. I got yeah? it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, anyone else uh, questions about the color grading? No. Okay, I'm going to go with something else. So now we go to the style. So that's the, the last new section. So basically you can only use the styles uh, in the latest version of Photoshop, okay, in 2021. Uh, and if you don't have Photoshop 2021, uh, but let's say 2020 or 2019, you can still use the styles, but you cannot use the PS automatic styling anymore. But then you have to load your own mask. But the thing is, I, I, I think that if you would load your own mask, it's still very useful, if, even if you are working with, photo, with the latest version of Photoshop, okay? Because now you can mix up all the, the styles. So styles is actually meant, I've created that, to make use of the latest features of Photoshop and the latest features in Photoshop is the following. So what it does, and I think most of you have already seen it, but if you go here, you can basically, where was it again? I think it was under edit, sky replacement. Okay, I'm never replacing skies by the way. But the thing is, what, what you can do with it is to create your own sky mask. So for example, if I take a photo with a, let's say this one, okay. And, uh, and if you are, uh, let's say a more serious black and white photographer as I am, uh, then uh, you wouldn't uh, replace sky, but uh, I have nothing against it, by the way. If you want to replace sky, skies, feel free to uh, do so, but I never do that. I prefer to uh, use my own sky, the actual sky, and then adjust it to my own liking. But in any case, you can also use this to create your own sky mask, and it does a really, really good job, okay? So what you do is uh, something like this, there are two ways, by the way. And now you can uh, play with the sh uh, shift edge. And people who have seen my advanced masking workflow will know that I also play with the shift edge to refine your edges a little bit better, okay? But here you can do that. Let's say that I like it like that. And I'm saying, okay, uh, output to new layers, okay? And now you, if you see, if you look here, you have, and you click with Alt, or an option and you click on that, you see the mask of the sky created by Photoshop and then you can refine it. Okay, so basically if you know about my uh, advanced masking class, then you could do the following. So I'm going to load this, uh, I'm going to, hold on a minute. This is sky mask. Okay, what I can do is duplicate that channel and call it PS sky. So if you stand on that, Okay, if you stand on this mask here, you will see it here in your channels like this. If you don't stand on that, but let's say you stand over here, you don't see that sky mask. But if you stand on it like this, oops, like this, you can then you see it here and then you can duplicate it and you can create your own PS sky mask. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this. Okay, get rid of that entire fold because I don't want, don't want to replace my sky. 
But now you can work on this further. So this is something that Photoshop has created automatically and it does a really great job. And now you can play with your Pro Tools and say, okay, I'm going to refine a little bit more like this and then do the mask and mask selection technique. And I'm not going to explain that here, but the thing is people who know about the fast masking class know exactly what I mean with that. And now you can create, oh, sorry, that's a little bit too much, but you can now, let's say, go back here and you have a perhaps better mask. And you can also refine it in, in other ways, like doing this, for example, and then go with the L4, okay, et cetera. Okay, it's not a perfect mask, but Photoshop still does a great job with it, okay? And it saves you a lot of work, okay? So this is how you can make use of the latest Photoshop features, but there's another way, by the way, and that is this one, hold on a minute. So here, you also have this, subject and sky. So if you click on that, then Photoshop automatically creates the, the same sky mask. Okay, so now it's loaded. It's done by Photoshop. You can save it and you can have a look at it. I call it T1. All right, so now you can go in here. You see that? And now you can also uh, refine it to your liking. Okay, but if you do it with the sky replacement feature, you can shift the edge so you can make it even more accurate, okay? And now you can refine it uh, further on. And so by going with something like, uh, like this, for example, okay? And then again, do the mask and mask technique. Again, if you wanna know more about that, then you have to watch my class about fans masking and then you can refine it a little bit further, okay? And basically, this is what I'm doing in here. So I'm making use of that Photoshop feature in here and in there. I refine the mask behind the scenes using my advanced masking technique. And then uh, you can apply it sp a specific style there. Okay, I'm not going to go into the technical details, but that's what I'm using. That's why you need Photoshop 2021 for that. It also does the following. I will show you that. Uh, you can also select the subject. Okay, and that's what I'm using here as well. So here, if I try using the Photoshop subject detection, it does a pretty good job, but it's not perfect. Again, you see that here, it's not very accurate, but still, you know, you have a great starting point and you can save it, I can show it to you, I call it T3, going to have a look. You see that it's not a very accurate isolation of the figure, but you know, it's a great way of uh, uh, having a starting point for your masking, for your masking uh, well, sequence after that. And especially if you know about my advanced masking workflow, you will know how to further refine this kind of mask, but it's a great starting point. And again, I'm using those techniques in here. Okay. So let's try it out. So I've already created mask here, but that's for, for later on but I wanna show you what you can do with it. So if you have Photoshop 2021, okay, you can use the automatic styling. So now you can say, uh, well, here, sub if you click on those, then the subject or foreground will be affected. So if you choose architecture landscape, then the, the subject and foreground will be affected. If you choose still life, it will do the subject detection technique and will apply to the still life thing only. So let me show you with this. So if you click, uh, well, first I have to do a black and white conversion. So let me do a neutral. Okay, so that's neutral. And now I can go to styles. So it would be a great starting point to work on your image or you can use it as a final step uh, to refine or to whatever you wanna do with it. Okay, but it's mostly meant to gain some inspiration to get some ideas or to get a good starting point. That's why I created all those styles. So I, if I click here, so it will detect the flower automatically. It will refine it behind the scenes and it will apply all sorts of uh, things like this. You see that? Just by clicking on the still life. You can also do the other one. So I'm going to get rid of this. You can click on still life one, which is a little bit more subtle. 
but what's behind here, behind Still Life 2, is, okay, I'll show you this first. This before, this is after. Just simple preset button, okay? But what's behind this one is quite complicated because I'm going to create luminosity mass behind the scene. I'm going to intersect it with the, uh, with the automatically detected selection by Photoshop that I've refined, then applies a few highlights and darkening uh, presets. And then you get this kind of results. So I'm going to click on it again. See that? That's all done uh, with, the, with, the, with the preset. All right, so uh, what you can also do is if you go here, so this is the, uh, I've already converted to black and white. You can just, if you wanna go crazy, you can just say, you know what? Even though this is architecture, I should be clicking on architecture, but you get a very modest kind of uh, style. Okay, I'm going to click on it. It takes a while because uh, Zoom is running on the background. So it's going to affect the performance of my computer. I've noticed that whenever I do Zoom, then everything's running a little bit slower on my computer, but this is what you get then, okay? But if you wanna go crazy, what you can do is also the following. You can say, you know what? I'm, I'm just letting the computer know that it's a sort of still life. Just click on still life too. So it detects the subject and it will uh, apply a treatment that I actually created for still life, but can look good on architecture as well. You see that? Okay. But this is all automatic styling. You can also uh, click on one of those presets over there. So what it does then, it will uh, adjust the entire photo, not just a specific part of the photo. Okay. But it works through automatic sky detection. So if you don't have a real sky in your photo, then this is not going to work. Okay, let me show you that. One second. If I try, let's say something like this. Where is the, uh, okay. Bear with me, please. Uh, I'm looking for the famous bird photo. Is uh, Philippa Alexander also here in the session? I thought she was here, but this is her photo. Philippa, are you there? If not, and if so, again, thank you for providing me with this photo that you took. Philippa but is the, here. Philippa's here. Okay, Philippa, again, thank you for providing the photo and I'm, I'm still going to use it. It's uh, one of my favorite photos to use in my demonstrations, by the way. So here you don't have a real sky. So if you, if, if you try clicking on this, for example, you will see that it's not going to do much. You see that sky selection is too small or no sky available. So it's quite, uh, quite clever. Okay. So it detects if there's a sky or not. So you cannot do that here. Okay. Uh, going back to my, where was I? This photo. But here, you know, uh, you can click on that. It will apply a specific look. Uh, let's say, let's go with high key bold. but it will apply a specific style to the entire photograph. Again, it will detect a sky. So for, for this kind of scapes, you really need a sky, either landscape sky or architecture sky or whatever, but you need a sky. A real sky that is. You see that? This is not my favorite preset by the way, but in some cases this might work out well. Okay, I'm going to show you another photo, landscape this one, okay, I'm going to go black and white first, neutral. My Photoshop's running really slow right now. Okay, I don't know why, but... So here I could click on this and it will give you a specific kind of look. It's a, a very famous uh, preset that's also in use, I think, if I'm correct, at the in SilverFX Pro 2 back then. It's called Triste or Triste. I don't know how to really pronounce it. I think it's a, I think it's a French word, right? I mean, but 
it creates a specific look to the uh, to the photo, like like that. Okay. All right. So, but I think those are even more interesting because what happens here if you click on this and it sees the sky, what it does is to darken the sky a little bit, remove the then it removes the contrast, and then it will add the highlights through the intersection of luminosity mass. I will show you that in a second. Okay, I need to buy a new computer, by the way, but this is what it does, you see that? And basically, this is one of my favorite presets, dark plus highlights, because it does a lot of things behind the scenes that I think is very useful in, uh, well, in, in, in black and white photography in general, okay? If, especially if you have a, uh, a sky like that. Creating mood. Exactly, yeah, creating a mood. But uh, it's done in the right way, the way that I've always been teaching. Meaning, first remove the contrast and then uh, darken it and then add some light highlights through the luminosity mass. That's what's happening behind the scenes, okay? So you can play with that and you can uh, mix up uh, uh, subjects. I mean, I I've shown you that with, uh, with this. I, I can, let's say, again, create uh, this still life, even though it's not a still life. I actually need to shut down Photoshop for a second because it's getting really slow right now. But you see this, right? But okay, this is the effect that you can get by using automatic styling. And uh, I would suggest to play around with it. But even better is this, load your own mask. So if you don't have Photoshop 2021, you can still use this, but then you have to have your own mask. So I've done that. I've, I've already have the, the mask over there. So what you can do then is the following. You can say, okay, I still wanna have a, that's still life, look for that building. So I, I start with that. So I'm now going to select entire building. Okay, so it's going to apply that look. Okay, now I can say, I wanna have a sky with, uh, let's say make it, full, uh, well, I'm going to try this dark to light. So that obviously you have to load your sky. Like that, not really happy about that. Let me try this one. I actually need to close down Photoshop for a minute, but this is getting really slow, but okay, I have something like this. I'm going to get rid of that over there. Okay, I'm going to close it down because I'm looking at my zoom controls, they are in the way. So I have something like this. Now I can load, let's say, um, I'm going to load the foreground. So I'm going to click on architecture. So here you have to load the foreground. So let's do that. Okay, so you see that? Go like that. I'm going to get rid of uh, this one, by the way. Just delete layer. And now I want to make the sky even darker. So I'm going to make it dark and flat. Let's see if that's going to work out. The upper right could have your 45 degree angle. Say that again? My what? Your upper right could have your 45 degree angle. Oh yeah, I, I could have done that too. But you see here, just by clicking on the styling presets, you can easily get something like this and you see some banding there. But again, this is zoomed out. So it's downscale to eight bits, 
Okay, if I zoom in to 100%, so I should be back on one, uh, sorry, on six, six, 16 bit. You sh shouldn't be able to see the banding. If you still see the banding, then it's real banding. Here, I went a little bit too far. You see that there's still some banding visible there, even at 100%, meaning this is real banding. So you can easily get rid of that by load selection sky, and then click on this add noise. And then it's going to add noise, but in a very uh, non-distracting way, I think. And then you don't have any banding anymore. So basically what, what's behind this is this here. You go to uh, filters, noise, add noise. Is this, this setting, 1.1, Gaussian and monochromatic. That's a default setting that I always use in, in almost all of my photos that I would post on social media. Because the thing is, when you post it on social media, it's always an, an 8-bit JPEG photograph, right? So if you are pushing the contrast quite a bit, you will see a lot of banding. It's not real banding, but even if it's a real banding, you know, you can get rid of it by adding noise, All right? But uh, if it's not real banding, you can get rid of it very easily like, like this. And I would always recommend if you post it on social media, know that you're always working with an 8-bit image. So if you are pushing a contrast, you will always see banding. And the easiest way to get rid of it, you just click on this. It will get rid of the banding for social media purposes. If you don't like it and you print it output in your final image that you're going to print out, then don't do it, okay? Because the thing is, if, the, if there's no real banding, but just let's say the, the downscaling banding that, that Photoshop does, and uh, then if you print it out, you won't have any banding. Does it make, do I make sense here? So basically, so most of the times the banding is always a downscaling issue introduced by Photoshop. Any questions about this? Any questions about styling? But I would just recommend just playing with it, okay? Because you can mix styles, especially if you have your own mask, you can just play around with it and get some inspiration. And that's what I created this for. Okay, nice. so uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, th that's for the demonstration. I wanna take your questions. And I want to have a look at the questions that people have been asking through uh, the online forum. Mike, do you have the questions there with you? What do you want me to discuss? Okay, let's see here. Um, let me find it. Can you share your screen, Mike, or can't you? Um, yeah. yeah. Well, would that be easier? Because then we'd have to switch back and forth. Okay, hold on. I, I'm going to um, look it up myself. Okay, but I'm, I'm okay. not sure. I'm not sure if it's the 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 censored the <laughs> censored one because I hope you remove my stupid uh, test question. Okay. No, this, I didn't. Okay, ju just just ignore <laughs> this question. Okay. <laughs> this, was, this was just a test question. Okay. This, I'm not being serious here. And, okay. And this one from Mike. Th this is not a serious question either. Okay. So just. Yes, it is. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to answer that question, but I, I like Heineken, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, shows a step-by-step -step simplified workflow for the most generic black and white photo, the one that we can extend and modify for other types of photos. I, th I think I've done that in the beginning already with the landscape photograph, but do you guys want me to repeat that with another photo or what do you think? Or with the same photo just to, well, for people who didn't, follow that part this, this is the time that you can unmute yourself and uh just feel free to to talk out if you want to see a simplified workflow but I, I believe i've already done that and i think there are so many other questions that i think are just as important anyone okay let's move on okay move on okay so i think i've done this in the beginning already uh Let's do this, Pro Tools. What is the difference between normal adjustments and selective adjustments? What do you mean in this regard with add plus amplify and amplify? So this is something that I've been uh, ex demonstrating, explaining in my previous webinars on Artisan Pro, but also with the uh, advanced masking class. 
So the thing is the following. Okay, I'm going to go here. Let's take another photograph. I'm going to take this. I'm going to get rid of that. Um, uh, okay, let's go do the bird by Philippa Alexander. So uh, the thing's the following. Okay, I'm going to grab and pull up another file first before I do that. Uh, the grayscale grid. Okay, there it is. So we're going to run a bit later today, uh, but that's something that most people can expect from me. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. So this is a grayscale grid. So you see here all the uh, luminous values on a grayscale uh, photograph, starting from zero up to 255. So pure black, pure white, and all the uh, values in between. Okay, so I'm going to turn this off. The thing is uh, with the Pro Tools. So basically the Pro Tools is meant to edit your photo or to create masks, okay? Or both at the same time. So basically this can be used, in other words, can be used on either your, uh, in either layers mode when you're editing your photo or else in channel mode when you're masking something or when you're creating when you're creating a mask makes sense right so that's one of the reasons that whenever you click on one of those presets normal adjustments or selective adjustments it doesn't create a layer automatically a new layer automatically so you have to either uh, create a, a new layer yourself or don't do that and just go play in the channels panel. Hopefully that makes sense. That's one of the reasons that, uh, that it doesn't create a new layer automatically because you can also work on it on your mask. So the thing is with normal adjustments and uh, selective adjustments the following. Those uh, presets that you see here, they are overlay gradients. So gradients, linear gradients and overlay mode. What does that mean? Basically, Whenever you try to darken a lighter area with one of those presets over there, it needs to have a value that's different than pure white because pure white won't be affected. The same for lightning. You can only change a value if it's not pure black. So this. So basically, it, the overlay gradient excludes this zero and, exclude, and excludes this pure white, 255. So basically, this is the ideal setting to create mass, hard mass, because it, what, what you need to end up with is something that's pure black or pure white. That's why I created this, because it will exclude this and will exclude that, okay? So I can show you that. So for example, if I do this, and these are not overlay gradients, so they are normal gradients, linear gradients. So if I click here, everything turns black, right? Okay, I'm going to go back. If I do this with D2, then it's just something like 50% darker globally. So it will also affect the white there. Okay, so if I do it with this L4, then it shouldn't be affecting this. This 100% overlay gradient, but will affect the rest. I will show you. So you just hit that preset view. See that? That will always stay black. So basically very ideal for creating mass. Okay, so I'm going to go back and the same for darkening. If I do this 100%, this 75, 50, 25%. If I do this, then this will always stay white. You see that? I can click a few billion times on that, but it will never turn black, never, okay? That's the over, overlay gradient mode. So this ideal for creating mass. I hope you agree with that. So that's why I created this. And the reason that there are presets is that else, if, if you are masking something, you always have to do this. You have to grab this, set it to linear, overlay, then you have to adjust the settings to either 25, 50, 75, 100%, and you have to do this and then that and that, etc. So it's much easier to click on one of those presets. So that's the difference between normal and selective adjustments. And that's what I mean with amplify, because with this you amplify, but uh, if you want to, let's say, oh, I'm going to go back. Suppose that 
this is white and this is something that you want to make darker. So you cannot, you can never make this darker if you only use the overlay. So you have to add first, right? Before you can amplify it. So I can click on this 25%. So now it has a total value there. And now I can amplify it. You see that now it turns black. Is this clear now? Who was the one asking the question? What was Uwe, I think, right? Uwe, or I don't know how to pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Uwe, Uwe is right. Uh, I understand it now. Thank you. Okay. It's, so it's clear, right? Yes. And I hope it's also clear for, for everyone that if you uh, use those presets, the uh, those, that they are going to be uh, very great for creating mass. Okay, let me show you that with, uh, with the bird, okay? Because that's, okay, don't. So here, okay, so this is basically part of the advanced masking class. So I'm not going to explain everything in detail. If you wanna know more about it, uh, you can just, uh, well, uh, I think in this case, now you have to purchase my video with the 40% discount, by the way, last day, by the way. But anyway, it's not about that. Let me show you what I mean. So the thing is, uh, I wanna show you this. Photoshop can create a, a mask out of this subject, okay? And it does a great job, by the way. But as you know from my advanced masking class, uh, a good mask is always uh, based on the, the presence of uh, enough contrast or enough unique colors. And even though this is a sort of uh, artificial intelligence by Photoshop, it's still contrast and color based. So let me show you that. PS. Okay, I will show you that. Here, you see that the beak isn't there, right? Because there's not enough contrast. So it indeed can detect objects, but it's still contrast and color based, like I always said in my advanced masking video and class. So I didn't lie there because even Photoshop cannot mask this part because there's not enough contrast. Even though they have this machine learning kind of algorithm behind the scenes, they cannot mask the beak. And you know that how I solved that in my advanced masking video, I, I would go in there, I would uh, use the pen tool in that case and make and finish the selection. But I also wanna show you this. So for example, it's, it's a pretty good, decent mask. So if I go to my Quick Mask Pro, so now I'm going to digress a little bit because I wanna show you guys something, okay? So I wanna create a mask with my Quick Mask Pro. I'm not going to go into detail there, but I would start with the low key to create a base mask from. Okay. <clears throat> I did something wrong, okay. Okay, I didn't do something wrong. Hold on a minute, I have to redo it again because I will have to make sure there was no selection loaded. No, I'm sitting there. So I'm going to do it again. One second. Okay, so you get three base masks. I'm not going to explain the entire uh, Quick Pass Pro plan because this is not the time or place to do that, but I'm going to get rid of this. Okay, so you have this mask here. And then people know about my advanced masking workflow. They'll know that I'm going to load the, the mask itself. So. LK1, so for the mask and mask correction like this, I'm going to hit this, amplify, so I have this mask. I can now, let's say, uh, refine it a little bit more by doing this, okay. So let's say I have something like this. I can now do this, okay, wait a minute. Now I can compare it with that mask. Okay, I need to fix this here, but I can use my brush for that. Just set it to overlay. Set it to one percent. Just fix this a little bit. Okay. Set it to. Okay. I'm not going to explain this because this is something for a different kind of class. Okay. But I want to show you something. So this, this is the uh, Joel method of masking. Okay. Let's call it like that. I'm going to show you something. So this is by Photoshop. Just look at this this part. Look at that part. See this part. Is missing in Photoshop. This part there with the, the thing there or that part, just have a look at that. See this part there 
you see it's, it's less accurate. I hope you guys see that also here, just completely missing there. Okay, now look at my mask. That's better, right? You see this there, you see that there? It's there. Let's have a look at the hair. This is my mask, Photoshop. Joe, Adobe. Joe, okay, <laughs> this was just a joke, okay? But you see that this behind the scenes of Quick Mask Pro is my advanced masking technique. You see that it's quite different, right? But also the feathers there are a little bit better. Okay, so I just wanna show you this because uh, I think that uh, there's quite uh, a good use to what I'm doing here with the panel and, uh, and what I'm doing with my techniques in Quick Mask Pro and how you can get even better mask than Photoshop with just a few presets, okay? And basically what I've been doing in here in Quick Mask Pro is create a luminosity mask Okay, as, as a, as a uh, starting point, and then using the normal and the selective adjustments, including loading the, the uh, applying the mask and mask technique to refine it even more. But there's something more that I want to show you, and that's also very nice. And then, okay, so now I'm digressing a little bit. I hope you guys don't mind. But if you know a little bit about my uh, Quick Mask Pro tool, you know that with, if you choose the adjacent channel, Chase the zone, I mean, you can refine it even more. So I'm going to do that over here. So I go back to my mask. I can now do this. Let's just select this part. Okay. And now I can click on strong white. And now I have the transparency in the wings there. You see that? Okay. I'm going to invert this so you can see it better. There it is. And compare that with the Photoshop. I think uh, I, I think it goes to prove that I'm not all BS. <laughs> okay, so any questions about the the presets in uh, in here? Is it is this clear how to use that and what you can do with it? I hope so. Mike, can you see any questions over there? Else, I'm going to go to the next question that I think is important. Krishnadis, did you get your question answered? He says, can the selective adjustments be used? Oh, here's a question. Can the selective adjustments be used for cleaning the hard masks as it uses overlay blend mode? I think we just yes. answered that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. then David just had another question. Sometimes I find my images end up a bit on the dark side, almost if they were shot at nighttime. Is it possible that I am darkening too much in the beginning with a low key when removing the contrast? If I, David, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Might be easier. Yeah, hi, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Joel. Uh, yeah, just sometimes it, uh, after going through the process, Joel, I just find my images end up a little dark. And at the end, it, you know, I would naturally want to bring up the brightness, but that would sometimes blow out my highlights if I did it that way. So. I just wonder mm -hmm. if I'm doing something a little bit wrong in anywhere in the in the flow there in the process. Well, uh, I, I can judge it from here, you know, because then I have to uh, see your image. But sure, I think sure. you know what you've been describing there is uh, uh, is that I think you've not been subtle enough with the adjustments, okay? Because the thing is the following: what what is important for my workflow, and that's something that you see reflected in my panel as well. Uh, most adjustments are very subtle adjustments, right? I mean, whether you uh, use this or let's say the uh, advanced adjustments, if you click this or that, you will always see they're very, very subtle. The same for the creating depth. I mean, I see a lot of people doing this kind of stuff, a D3 or D4, also the advanced adjustment, D3, D4. I would always go with D1, L1, D1, mm -hmm. L1. Also, with creating depth, at the most, I would use I would use D two or L two, because I like to build up my image very gradually with subtle small changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you do it like that, you run a less uh, greater risk of uh, overdoing and pushing your image too much. Because what you described there is actually uh, something that I always call 
pushing the contrast way too much, okay, that uh, and not being subtle enough. I think, roughly speaking, that might be your issue. But I'm not sure about that because then I really have to see your image, you know? Because, okay, okay let me try showing you with that with this, okay? Suppose that, okay, I'm going to do a quick uh, uh, conversion. I've already done that. I'm just going to do a quick adjustment. So let me go with this again. So I'm going to repeat what I've done before, but I want to show you something, okay? Like this. I'm going to go here, remove the contrast, okay? And at the same time, darkening it. So you, you don't see the selection there. I'm going to do the same with sky. So I'm now going to load my sky selection there. Load sky selection. So for that, I'm also going to go with the global adjustments, low key now, because now I have a hard mask. Again, use this if you have a hard mask or if you want to apply to the entire photograph and use this here if you, if you don't have a hard mask. So basically it's a difference between let's say natural uh, hard edges like here, this is natural hard edge. This is a natural hard edge, edge. So use that then. And this you have to use when you have artificial edges, right? If you have this random freeform selection, it's not a natural hard edge. It's a freeform artificial edge, right? Then use this. Okay, but let me go back here to global adjustments, low key. Okay, go to go do this. So suppose that right now I would like to reveal the highlights a little bit more in the sky. Okay, but before I do that, I'm just going to make it just a little bit darker. Load selection. Basically, this is also the workflow that I would recommend uh, globally speaking. So start with lowering contrast, then darkening it, and then add the details through the luminosity mask. So here I would go again, sky there. So I'm going to uh, go from top to bottom to create a little bit of depth, darker here, lighter here. So let's go with D2. Okay. Okay, something like that. I'm not entirely happy over here. I think it's a little bit too light. So here I'm going to go to advanced adjustments and go with the uh, medium. Okay, that's way too much. Okay, I'm not going to do that. Let's say go soft. Okay, I think it's better. All right, so let's keep it like that. Now I want to add the highlights to the sky. So what you can do now is basically create a luminosity mask. I'm going to do this manually. You can also do it with the microphone, but let me do it manually. So the thing is here, and the thing you need to remember, if you create the, the luminosity mask, do it from your original unadjusted color photo. So it's here in the background. So I would create a luminosity mask now. On the Pro Tools, let's create a few light luminosity masks. Okay, so it's in here now. Okay, so let's say that I like to amplify the highlights in this specific section of the sky. So let's use this or that. Now, actually I prefer to have the light six and a half, somewhere in between six and seven. So I'm going to, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to get rid of those. I'm going to use this. Okay, six and a half. Okay, I'm going to use this. Okay, I'm going to duplicate that channel. I'm duplicating that so I can easily get rid of the rest. You see that? So there it is. So now I'm going to turn those on again. So I always create the luminosity mask off of the original unedited layer or file. Okay, always do that. Because if you do it from the edited version, you will see that the luminance values are completely different. Okay, might sometimes be better, especially if you try to get rid of halos. But in this case, I'm not trying to do that. You know, I'm just trying to. Uh, uh, bring back some detail in the sky. So I'm going to do that. And since this is, again, the Pro Tools, you have to add a new layer manually. So I'm going to do that like this. So now I'm going to load that luminosity mass selection that I have. But first I'm going to load the sky, the hard mass. Then I'm going to load the light six and a half. Then intersect it with that selection. 
Okay, so it's now intersected. Now I can use those or those. I prefer to use these presets over here because I don't need to add an amplifier because not, nothing here is pure white, nothing here is pure black. And, and basically these are more, uh, they are quite strong, those adjustments. So if you don't need to use that, then use this. Okay, so I'm going to do that with uh, L2. You see that? And you see, I'm not using L3 or L4, but I'm using those L1, L2 adjustments. So you go from here to there. And if you do it like that, you have more control over it. Okay, so don't try to come up with, with, with uh, big adjustments in, 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 in all, in, let's say in a few steps. I would never recommend doing that. That's also the reason, and now I'm going to go to this question here. Uh, where is that? I would like to know how you manage your different files create, created at each big step of the processing the app. So the thing is the following. A lot of people who see my workflow for the first time think it's a destructive workflow. No, it's not, it's not correct. Okay, I really have to correct you. And I've written an entire article on my website. So I'm not going to go into that. But the thing is, my workflow is a non-traditional workflow. And I've designed it like that because the thing is, I would usually create a photo consisting of sometimes hundreds of smaller adjustments, not 10, not 20, or even 50, no, hundreds. In some photographs, I even have thousands of adjustments. So imagine if I would use a traditional workflow with adjustment layers. I mean, I, I can never do that. I mean, my computer would crash immediately, okay? It's something that I've explained also in one of my previous webinars. So that is one of the reasons that I'm doing it like that. But the thing is the following. Okay, suppose that, uh, that this would be a final photograph. I would always uh, create layers like this, okay? They were, are being added on top of each other. So suppose that I've done this. I consider this, let's say, a major adjustment. I always group adjustments together in, let's say, areas. So I would say uh, the black and white conversion is already one major adjustment, okay? Then go here, for example, this. Suppose that I've, that, that I did a lot of adjustments in the foreground. I only did one. But just imagine that I did a lot of them. So now I would group them together. I would save this file. I call it iteration number two, for example. Then I would target another area, like, like the sky, for example. I would darken it, for example, uh, darken it in several ways. I would save that iteration again. So I have iteration number three or four. If I would lighten the same sky, I, I would do that again uh, with my panel. And then after uh, I'm done doing that, I would save it yet again as another iteration. So at, in the end, you end up with something like this. I will show you that here. You see that this iteration number one of that photo, it goes all the way up to iteration number 50. So they all represent groups of adjustments for a specific object. At, a detail, an element, or a plane in your photograph. When you're done with your photo, when, so when you arrived here, the flat and final version, you can get rid of all those intermediate files. So you only keep the original color file, that's this one, by the way, and the original uh, conversion, for example, over here. So this is the way that it work because the way that I work with subtle, small incremental steps cannot be done in a traditional workflow because I would need hundreds of adjustments layers and it, it would, would, would be completely impossible. On top of that, I believe that the use of adjustment layers is built in such a way, usually through, let's say, curves. And it's not easy to create a subtle adjustment with a curves tool, you know? You really have to do it in another way. Preferably, and that's why I do it like this, with the use of uh, uh, specific techniques like overlay gradients and try to target the, the pixel uh, based on its luminance value. I think, I believe that's much more subtle. 
does this exp uh, answer this question? Uh, that was Alain uh, Pujois. Uh, Do I pronounce it correctly, uh, Alain? Alain? Let me see. Okay, so that's already and also explained. That actually uh, answers that actually answers three of the questions, I believe. Is that so? Yeah. Okay, that even better. Does it also explain answer this question? No, just kidding, man. Gosh. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, we're already running out of time, you know. Uh, any final questions for now? What, or maybe you guys want to ask me, uh, want to select one of those questions out here in this spreadsheet that you want me to address. Is that an idea, uh, Mike, or anyone else? Uh, Joel, I have a question, Paul Evans. It's uh, the one regarding the blue skies. The blue sky thing. Yeah. Okay. Can you show me how to turn a blue sky very dark without? Without the artifacting and banding, that's the problem oh, I'm having. It always shows without... artifacts. Okay, so what do you mean, by the way, with artifacts? Are you referring to banding or other artifacts? Um, this, as you change the tone in the blue to something very dark black, it becomes very blotchy and um, there's obviously problems with it. Okay, how do you turn your blue sky black? Are you using the color channels for that or what do you do? I have tried a whole variety of ways of doing it and I don't seem to better solve the problem full stop. Um, from just darkening blue itself, as in the tone in raw, and changing it, to, uh, changing it that way, or even going into Photoshop and, and su selecting what you just suggested there. Um, I always seem to get very blotchy blue skies when uh, when I try and darken them, so I can do a very dark. What I'm what I'm looking to achieve is a very dark sky on a black yeah. and white image, almost something that's very close to black, but it just yeah. won't go black. It just becomes very blotchy and um, artifacty. Well. You know, it's, it's very hard to judge from here what's happening with your image. But the general rule of thumb is that uh, when you're pushing the contrast so much that it gets really black. So let's say you have the bright kind of sky. So basically, it's not about that blue sky. It's about the luminance value of that sky. So let's say you have a, uh, a blue sky with a normal exposed photograph. Let's assume that, Paul. Let's say that the sky is, let's say, somewhere in the mid-key high key uh, area, is, is that possible in yep. your case? Yeah. But you have a blue sky. So the question is not, uh, so the, the issue is not that you're going from blue to black. The issue is that you're going from mid key or high key to very dark. So you're really pushing the contrast so because it doesn't really matter if you have a blue sky or a gray sky, whatever kind of sky you have. Okay, God. okay. Huh? come on, <laughs> stupid notification. Oh my. Okay, I have to turn off my email because it's really annoying me now. Uh, where's my email? I, it's already turned off. Okay, so it's not about the color of the sky. It's all about the, the, let's say, the original exposure of your sky, the original luminosity in your sky. So if you go from mid-key or high-key to almost pure black, you're going to push it really, really hard, so much that it's almost impossible to avoid artifacts such as banding. It's almost impossible. Uh, and the thing that you see in, in, in a lot of my photographs, by the way, you see that I have those really dark skies, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me show you this. Okay, hold on. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but um, okay, let me go in here. Some of you might have already seen it, but let me see it here. Let me check if this is the one. Okay. All right. So waiting for the photo to load. So, okay. Anyone who has seen this demonstration before are not allowed to uh, play along, but to all you other guys. So if you look at this photo, if I, if I look at this specific section there, specific section there, 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 what would you guys say? In what tonal zone is this section in here? And what and then what tonal zone is this section in there? Anyone? Okay, I'm going to look at the chat box. Okay, so let's say, okay, hold on a minute. I'm going to add a new layer. Oh, 
I'm going to write it down. Okay, take my, where's my, there it is, okay. Oops, go here. Okay, so section number one. Okay, the blue section and this section number two. Okay, anyone guess? Uh, what is section number one? What tonal zone is that? What is section number two? I'm going to look at the chat box. Okay, so one for what? For zone one, for area one or area two? Just make sure that you also indicate that. Okay, so two and five, section one is zone one, section two is zone zero. Okay, yeah, all right. Okay, I'm just wait for a few more answers. I mean, I'm going to grab a drink. I, I, I think this is a very important to know for you, Paul, because then you know why uh, you might have a problem, okay? Yeah, because I've been trying to change the color blue and maybe I should have been looking at it from a luminosity point of view. Exactly, so I'm, I'm going to show you in, in, a, in a few seconds what, what I mean with this. Okay, so zone one for section two, and Leonard, Leonard Cox, uh, what would you say for section one? What would, what's, what zone would that be according to you? So one for both, Lynn Rostron. Okay, I think Lynn was already part of one of my previous uh, <laughs> sessions. <laughs> Not sure about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you, you were not allowed to, to play along now, okay? <laughs> okay, so the thing is the following. I'm going to show you. So most people think it's somewhere that this so, okay, hold on a minute. Let me check again. Mike, okay. I don't see the chat box anymore, but where is it now? Okay, uh, there it is. I think zone two, zone five. Okay, let's have a look. So the following is the case. I'm going to zoom in. Not like this, but I'm going to grab my eyedropper tool over there. So this looks like almost pure black, right? I hope you guys can see it here. You can still see the cables there and the background sky, right? So, but let me show you this now. If, it, if you click on the sky, you see that if you look here on the info section RGB, you see that it's a luminous value of six, two, 12, 15. So you know that it's a luminous value of somewhere between six and 15, right? Or even six and 12. So it's all zone zero, okay? Okay, so it's not pure black because pure black would mean it's zero, 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 right? But you don't see that here. I think the lowest value is six. You see that? Well. I see an incidental four, but usually it's somewhere between six and 12. I hope you guys would agree with me on that. You see that? Even 15, 16, but an incidental two, but let's say roughly six and 12. It's in between there. So it's not pure black. If I click on the cable, you see that it's always something like six, seven. So meaning, there's a very minimal difference between the background and the cable. It's all in zone zero, but the luminance value difference is sometimes two uh, luminous values, three, but not more than five or six, right? And still you can see the cable, right? This isn't, this, even the cable's not pure black. It's consistently six, seven. You see that? The cable here as well, five, okay, but here, it's just a little bit brighter, still all a zone zero. So I'm making a point for being very subtle about contrast adjustments in even in darker areas. It's enough to have a luminous value difference of just a few uh, luminous values like five or six to reveal the detail in this photo in a very subtle way. Because if you look at it like this, it looks pure black. 
but if I would print this out, this has been printed out, hanging in the gallery, uh, uh, very large, and you could see all the details in there. Okay, and you, you'll all see that I'm not suffering from any strange artifacts there. Okay, maybe there was a little bit of banding, I'm not sure about it anymore, but uh, in any case, that was already mitigated by the ad addition of noise, okay? Not because I had banding, but I like to add a little bit of noise to my skies. That's just my personal preference. Okay, now let's have a look at this part here. You see there, 33, 38, 29. This looks like the brightest area, right? 38. This part, so 38, that looks very bright, is zone one. It's not zone five, not zone three, it's zone one. So there's just a minimal difference between this and that in zones, but a dramatic difference in visual perception with just one zone. So if you're trying to create contrast in your image, so by going completely black here, let's say zone zero and going with zone 10 here, you're overdoing it, okay? You're doing things that don't need to be done. So I'm making a case for subtlety. It's enough to have one zone difference and even a few luminance values difference in here to reveal details in a way that I think is much more subtle. So hopefully also uh, that was, was it uh, Paul Evans, right? Paul. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully this also answers a part of your question because I, I don't really know your situation, but I'm making this point here to be very subtle about it. If you create contrast, it's not even necessary, especially not in a ground part of your, of your photo. So this, the sky is a ground, right? This is the figure. The highest contrast should be here, not here. So if you have here, let's say something in zone zero, and even with, with the luminous value of zero, you are going too dark if you have something like zone eight or nine in here, even 10, you know? Because then you're just just exaggerating that it's not necessary. This is just one zone difference. I'm making a case about subtlety. Okay, I hope I've made a point here. I hope this also partly answered your question, Paul. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's fine. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're running late now. So I'm taking one final question for now. Anyone? Or Mike, do you have a suggestion for a question that I could take from the spreadsheet? No, I think we covered the spreadsheet. Joel, could I ask about the surface finishes question I, I submitted, please? So, sorry, who was that? I, I didn't hear that. It's Jim here, Joel. Uh, I'd asked a question about surface finishes, the panel, how much it can influence the, the final uh, okay. on surfaces. Okay, you okay, Jim Scott. Okay, so okay, let me see this. Uh, can the panel be used to influence the final surface finishes on buildings such as green? Yeah, okay, okay, this is a great one. Okay, you 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 were referring to this question, right? Yes, I said, thanks. Okay, hold on a minute. I'm going to close this down. So, this is the final one. Okay, okay, I'm going to close this down. Uh, let me find my image. Uh, okay, let me find a good example. So bear with me for a few seconds or minute. Um, let me see. Uh, I have. Chicago. Okay, let me go with this image. Okay, this is the Trump Tower in Chicago with the Rickley building. Okay. Uh, by the way, I'm not making a political statement over here, okay? It's just, just a building over here. All right, so open this now. Did I open that file or didn't I do that? Oh, it's still working in the back. Okay, so here, this is the original, uh, well, it's not the original file, it's, uh, let's say, black and white conversion with a few adjustments. You see here that I've tried to make this building more glossy, more shiny, right? So the way to do that, if you want to do that, 
Yes, you can do that with a panel, but you have to know a little bit about how light works. Okay, so basically, I you could say the following: if you have a uh, a gradient reflection that's very very thin and small and very intense in brightness against a darker surface, you create you create the illusion of glass or metal, and the wider the great the reflected gradient is the the less shiny the surface looks so basically if you look here this part of the building this building you see that there are no okay sorry it's better to look at this there are no let's say reflections in there no reflected gradients in there but they are here so the perception of this building is much more like a shiny glassy or metallic kind of building right well, this is more concrete building. So what you have to do then is to diffuse the light much more. While here, you have to really work with uh, uh, super small gradients to create the illusion of uh, glass or metal. I can show you that here. Let me try to open this one. That's a little bit darker, I think. So opening up another file, hopefully this is a little bit darker so I can use that. Okay, so let me use this. So you see I've darkened that area, right? So suppose that I wanna create something like this that looks much more shiny like this. Okay, you darken it first, okay? To do that, I'm going to get rid of those stupid uh, guides over there so you darken it first and now you have this specific tool in here under creating depth special facts one of my favorite tools in here okay you can now go do this so you, you take your marquee tool you cannot go smaller than five pixels by the way because if you go smaller than five pixels you cannot create the reflection because it always needs to be at least five pixels wide but I'm going to create something like 15 pixels wide. So here you go with uh, L2 vertical. Okay, now make it a little bit more subtle like that, like that, like that. Now you can free transform it by right clicking on it, put it there and you can... Okay, this is not uh, very good. Okay, this is a little bit too much, you see that? But the thing is, you get the idea, right? I, I should also make one that's a little bit bigger so let me do that first. It's a little bit wider, something like this. Go do that, make it a little bit more subtle. So with this, you can make it smaller or, th or thinner, okay? Now I can, let's say, deselect it. If I would, Move this a little bit there. I think you get the idea, right? You can already see the shiny effect of it, right? The thinner it is, the more shiny the surface look, looks, right? You can all, this is the f final result of there. You see that? Basically I've done the same principle in, in this building. So that is how you can do it. Uh, it, it, it is quite, uh, I mean, if you, if you do it for the first time, it might look unnatural, but I can show you another example that's maybe even better. Hold on a minute. Uh, there is the, the scar. So I have an image here, this one. So this is a, uh, part of a calendar that I created uh, seven years ago for a German automotive company. And this is how it looks like in real life, because the thing is, it was a very expensive car. I had to shoot 13 of those cars, uh, Ferraris, uh, very vintage classic exotic cars that were insured for, let's say a few million dollars per car. So the thing is, what they wanted me to do was to create something that was in fine art style with all those beautiful effects. But the thing is, 
we were not allowed to drive those cars. So they had to be shot outside like this. So how do you get from here to there with those studio lighting effects? Well, you can do that with, with a panel too. So I'm going to open up another one. Let's say this one, number two. So waiting for it to open. Still opening or yeah, there it is. Okay, so here we go. So like I said, the smaller the reflected gradient and the more intense the light, the more shiny it looks, right? I've already applied a few of those gradients in there in this specific section. I can do it again. So I can do something like this. Okay, that's a little bit too wide, I think, a little bit smaller. Like that. Click on this. Okay, I'm going to refine it a little bit, make it a little bit smaller and thinner. Okay, now I can free transform it and put it right there. See that? I hope you get the idea. Who, uh, who was this question from? From Jim Scott, right? Jim, uh, yeah. this is. Thank you. Yeah, so you can do all that with the panel. And it looks very, I can tell you, it looks very natural. It's, the trick's in there. If you want to make it look more like concrete or like uh, brick or whatever, you know, and then make sure that the gradient is very wide. So it's, it has to be this diffuse kind of look. So that's how you can do that. Okay, that was the final question that I'm that I'm taking. Uh, well, I think we've, we've come to the end of the uh, session. Hold on a minute. Before I turn on my video, I'm going to throw away my cigarette. <laughs> Everyone, you can see me now, if I'm correct. Any questions for now? Some final remarks, whatever, critique. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you so me. much, Joel. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. Thank you very much, Joel. We can right. never disappoint. Thank you very oh, much. Glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, unbelievable. Thank you, unbelievable. Thank you. Thanks to you, Mike, as well. Thank you. Mike didn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, I'm just annoying. Extremely <laughs> worthwhile, Joel. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good I'm, day, everyone. Thank you. Everyone I'm, I'm just safe kidding. And well. Mike, I'm just kidding. You know that, right? Okay. Yep. Thanks a lot, Joel. Thank you, Jorge. Thanks everyone for your participation. I think we all agree that Joel went above and beyond uh, like he always does and amazed everybody with uh, stuff that uh, I, I have not seen before. Uh, incredible, incredible session.